<laughs> Father, we thank you for that night when the Christ child was born. He was born for us that we might live eternally. And how, how we praise you and thank you for that holy night. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> well, I want to welcome you again. And, you know, even though that was virtual, I just felt the touch of the Lord on that. And I praise him for that. Um, it is such a blessing, again, f uh, to me, that you took tonight out to be here. Because it's a time of year where it's very busy. Many things are going on. and um, But you're here. And my heart for you tonight, my desire for you tonight, is for you to leave here desiring to know your Savior on a deeper level. And my desire is for you to develop a deeper, deeper love and adoration for him more than you have when you came into this room. Because I know you're women who love him. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here, unless you were dragged by a friend. <laughs> I've been dragged by a friend before I knew the Lord. But, but really, for the most part, most of us love God, right? You know? And there may be some of you here tonight. Um, you know, for me, my Christmases past were beautiful. I've had very good, fond memories, beautiful memories of Christmases past. But maybe tonight there are some of you here that don't share that same sentiment. You know, Christmas may remind you of a hurtful memory, or it may bring sadness to your heart because you've lost a loved one, maybe, at this time of year. Whatever state your heart is in, I believe, I know without a shadow of a doubt, that the message of the Savior will minister to you no matter what the condition of your heart is tonight. You see, the message of the Savior is love divine. Love divine. This message goes back to that beautiful, beautiful night when our precious Jesus, the Christ child, was born. We saw that night prophesied so beautifully in the book of Isaiah. In chapter 9, verse 6, and you're all pretty familiar with this because it comes from the Handel's Messiah. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. You know, every time I read this portion of scripture, something just springs out, leaps out of the scripture into my heart. And that is those three words, for unto us. For unto us. For unto us. A child was born, right? For unto us. A son with a capital S was given. And not only that, but he will reign as sovereign ruler of all nations, of all the worlds, of all things. He will reign. And we have that hope. We have that peace. We have that truth. It's a truth that this is going to happen. We have that, ladies. And not only that, this verse says, his name, and I always stop at that because sometimes, truly, his name will take my breath away. Sometimes when I just say the name Jesus, just that lovely, just Jesus, when I think on his name, it kind of takes my breath away. Why does it do that? Because I learned as a young Christian that the name of God is his character. The name of God defines who he is and what he wants to become to you. And that takes my breath away because we see in verse 6 of Isaiah 9 that he's wonderful, that he's counselor, that he's mighty God, that he's an everlasting, never-ending, always-there father, he is 
the Prince of Peace. In a world of chaos, he is the Prince of Peace to you and I. Max Licato said this. I'm going to be quoting Max Licato a couple times tonight, only because he's, he's got such a gift of words. There's something about how he writes. I don't know all that Max Licato believes at this time. You know, years ago, I would feel safe quoting people because I kind of knew where they were. But times are different now, right, ladies? And people are off. <laughs> so I'm not going to tell you to go read Max Licato. I'm just saying there's a couple quotes here that are really good, okay? I'm just going to throw that out to you. And he says this, he went from commanding angels to sleeping in straw, from holding stars to clutching Mary's finger. The palm that held the universe took a nail of a soldier. Why? Because he loved us so. He loves us so. Our mighty God he became human flesh. God became flesh, was born in a cold and dirty stable. He had no place to lay his head. His bed of hay spoke nothing of his kingly throne or crown, right? But our majestic God, the one who inhabits eternity, became flesh and dwelt among us. And he took my and your sins to the cross because of his great love for us. Roy Leshen said this. Roy Leshen is the author of The Calvary Road. It's a classic. If you haven't read it, pick it up and read it. If you've read it before, read it again. So great, so rich. He said this, there is no one like Jesus. Truly our heart's greatest celebration at Christmas is to adore him, seek him, Thank him and praise him. He is the pathway upon which we travel, the truth we seek to know, the life we so desperately need. His grace is greater than our arms can embrace. His beauty is more than eyes can behold. And his love is deeper than our hearts can explore. And I have said this before, and I'm going to say it again. And I'll say it every time, he loves you individually so much, just you, that if it was only you, that he had to go to the cross and die for your sins, he would have done it. If it was just you or just me, that's how much he loves you. You know, this contemporary Christian song, Christmas song that we sing tonight, we sang it, Noel, it inspired me for this message tonight. I'm going to just go through the lyrics real quick again. It says, love incarnate, love divine. Stars and angels gave the sign. Bow to babe on bended knee, the savior of humanity. Unto us, there's those three words, a child is born and he shall reign forevermore. Noel, Noel, come and see what God has done. Noel, Noel, it's a story of amazing love. And we, we forget that at this time of year because we get very busy with all the things we have to do, right? <laughs> for the holiday, for Christmas, and all the things. We forget it's a story of amazing love. And then it goes on, it goes on to say it's the light of the world given for us son of god son of man there before the world began born to suffer born to save born to raise you and i from the grave christ is the everlasting lord and he shall reign forevermore noel noel come and see what god has done noel noel it's the story of amazing love so that is what I want us to think on tonight as I move forward. It's a story of amazing love. Noel comes from the Latin verb nasi, meaning to be born. The birth of Jesus, which was referred to as natalis dies, meaning day of birth. 
the Aramaic and the Hebrew word for Noel is, sh is a shortened form, Norad or Norad Elohim, meaning, yes, born of God. That's what Noel is. You know, we sing these things and we're like, what does that mean? <laughs> you know, and that's what it means, born of God. And this story of amazing love, when you think of the word story, I don't know about you, but I sometimes think of a story being something that might not be factual or true. This, ladies, is true. This story of amazing love is true. It's fact. So I'm just going to bring out a couple of aspects of his love, maybe four of them tonight. We, the, the song we sang, and scripturally, it's a love incarnate. Love incarnate. You know, Colossians 1.15 says that he is the image, Jesus, of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. John 1.14 reads, The word, Jesus, became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And we see in Luke 1, verses 34 through 37, that Mary's response to the angel, that, you know, that she was going to have a virgin birth, we see her response, the sinless child, God incarnate. And she responds, she says, how can this be, since I did not know a man? This was love incarnate. Philippians 2.8, being found in an appearance as a man, God humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Love incarnate means God embodied in flesh in human form, sinless, spotless Jesus, baby child in that manger was God incarnate and it's such a mystery to believe and such a mystery to behold Charles Spurgeon said this about this for first the birth of Christ was the incarnation of God it was God taking upon himself human a mystery a wondrous mystery to be believed in rather than to be defined this is a story of, a, of, a, of love incarnate. And you know why I bring that out firstly? That's doctrinal, ladies. Doctrine. That's doctrine. God came down as Jesus in flesh. Flesh and blood. Virgin birth. That's doctrine. Jehovah Witnesses don't believe that. And they will argue that. They don't believe that Jesus was in the flesh. He was just a spirit. And it's so important for doctrinally to know he is incarnate. So that's why I wanted to bring that love incarnate out. He is God, sinless, pure, and he was the one who went to the cross for you and I. We see that this is a story about love divine. Divine means proceeding directly from God. <laughs> Excellent, delightful, extremely good and holy. That's the kind of love God has. It is love in its purest form. 1 John 4, 8 through 10 says, He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us, this divine love, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation of our sins. We must stop looking for love in all the wrong places. We do that as women. We look for love in a relationship. We look for love in uh, focusing in our children or our grandchildren or whatever it is. But we, sometimes we look for love in all the wrong places. We need to look for his divine love. Do you know him tonight as you sit here? 
I'm asking you that because I thought I knew him at one point in my life because I knew everything here. I had all the facts, but I had not surrendered my life to him. I had not given him, relinquished, come full control of my life over to him, knowing I'm a sinner, knowing that the blood is the only thing of Jesus that could keep me saved and go into heaven. It wasn't my good works. It wasn't what I thought he was. I needed to surrender my life fully over to him. Have you done that tonight? Are you here? And have you done that? And if you haven't, please see me afterward. Because your life will be changed for an amazing way. The only way you can get to heaven is through the blood of Jesus and no other way. And you may be an amazing person. I'm sure you are. You may be one of the best people there is. I'm sure you are. That doesn't get you to heaven. Only the blood of Jesus and receiving him as your Lord and Savior and fully giving your life over to him, surrendered completely. And please see me if you have not done that because I would love to talk to you. You know, Corey Ten Boom said this, Who can add to Christmas? The perfect motive is that God so loved the world. The perfect gift is that he gave his only son. The only requirement is to believe in him. And the reward of faith is that you and I shall have everlasting life. So, love incarnate, love divine. And this story is about a love extravagant. I love the word extravagant. <laughs> it means exceeding what's reasonable. He bestows his love. He lavishes his love. He's generously lavishing in extreme quantities his love on us. He heaps, he pours, he rains, he showers his love on us. And he does this in spite of us. He does this in spite of our sins, in spite of our frailties, in spite of our shortcomings, in spite of our backslidings, in spite of the fact that we may not really want to surrender our lives to us. He loves us extravagantly. Isaiah 53, 12 said, it is Jesus that poured out his soul unto death. Think about that. How, how much more extravagant can you get than to die for someone? And he poured his love for us, for you and I. Romans 5, 5 reads, Now hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out or lavished in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. You see, his love is worthy, trustworthy, and pure, and unconditional, everlasting, and sacrificial. That's extravagant. That's an extravagant love. Billy Graham said this, The very purpose of Christ coming into the world was that he might offer up his life as a sacrifice for you and I, for the sins of all men. He came to die. And ladies, Billy Graham says, this is the heart of Christmas. Oh, how we must never forget that this is the heart of Christmas. That he loved us so extravagantly that he died for us. That he sacrificed for us. Fourthly, this is a story about unfailing love. Unfailing love. Jeremiah 31.3 reads, The Lord has appeared of old to me, saying, Yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love, and therefore with loving kindness I have drawn you. And I love Romans 8, 37 through 39. Talk about unfailing. Talk about not having anything rip out or rip it apart, you know? Romans 8, 37, 39 through 39 reads, Yet in all things we, you and I, are more than conquerors through him who loved us. There's that love, that unfailing love. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life 
nor angels, or principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able, able to separate you and I from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Psalm 136 verse 26 reads this way in the New Living Translation. It says, give thanks to the God of heaven. His faithful love endures forever. He is faithful. His love never fails. He never falls short, nor does he give up. Zephaniah 3.17 reads, The Lord, your God, is in the midst. The Mighty One will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you in his love, his unfailing love. He will rejoice over you with singing. God's love never fails. Some of you may be thinking, well, I feel like God had failed me. He took my son. He took my husband. He took my grandchild. When I needed him the most, it seemed like he wasn't answering. When I prayed and prayed and prayed, it never happened. And you might be sitting here tonight feeling like, yeah, God has failed me, Cindy. But I want to read the definition of fail. And when I do, will you keep in mind God's character as you know it, according to scripture? This is the definition of fail. To lose strength. All right, right there. We know that God is a God of all power. He's all powerful. He's all strong. Weaken. He's not weak. We don't serve a weak God. He's a strong God. To fade or die away. We know that God never dies away. He's everlasting. He's from beginning to the end, the alpha, the omega, the beginning and the end, you know. He was and is and is to come, and he's always will be. So, you know, he, we know that he doesn't die away. The definition of fail means to stop functioning. God never stops functioning. To fall short, God never falls short. To be absent or inadequate, God's never absent, and he is never inadequate. It means to lack or be deficient. To leave undone. God never leaves anything undone. To neglect. God will never, ever neglect us. We might be feeling those things, but we need to fall back on what the truth of the Word of God says about the character of God. So he may disappoint you, and I have been disappointed. But that's me being disappointed. God doesn't disappoint. The scripture even says that, that he doesn't disappoint. And that he never fails us. He has an unfailing love. Oh, the love of God, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. And this is a story of amazing love. It's about a love divine, a love incarnate, a love extravagant, an unfailing love. So I ask you, what do we do <laughs> with this amazing love? What do you and I do with this amazing love? I think of John 1, 29. When the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and he said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. We need to behold his love. Behold in the Hebrew definition means to perceive through sight or apprehension, to gaze upon, to observe. Synonyms for the word behold are to gaze at, regard, contemplate, catch sight of, to glimpse, and to notice. Oh, we need to notice God. We get so busy, even as Christian women, and we neglect to stop and take notice of God, to behold, to behold his love. Behold means to look, to pay attention. And in the original King James Version, the word behold appears in the scriptures 
1,298 times. It's derived from the Greek word Ido, which has the literal translation, and I love this, be sure to see. Be sure to see. Or as I would like to say, don't miss this. <laughs> don't miss it. In the New King James Version, it appears half of those times. And in contemporary Bible versions, it only appears like 27 times. Why? Because it's a rarity. You know, we don't go around saying, oh, behold. <laughs> you know, we don't do that. But the scripture does. And who are we to behold? God. It means he is here. In fact, the contemporary Bibles read, instead of behold your God, it reads, here is your God. Here is your God. To behold is to regard, gaze upon, to view and to watch. If you behold someone or something, you see them. You see them. One author put it this way, to behold means to stop still, to cease all else, <laughs> to give our full attention and searching gaze to what is before us. And another put it this way, in our multitasking, fast-paced world, we are in the habit of, and I so related to this, looking everywhere at once with the result that nothing and no one truly has our deep and undivided attention. We are so captivated by new ideas, activities, and social connections that we forget to stop and behold his love. We must stop, ladies, stop still, cease all, give our full attention to our beautiful, amazing Christ child, God incarnate, love divine, love extravagant. We must take hold of this. We must behold it. Alistair Begg said this concerning Isaiah chapter 40. It's the portion of scripture that contains the introduction of the hope of the coming Savior. In Isaiah 40 verse 12, the verse stops and says, Behold your God. So this is what Alistair Begg is saying, and I love this. He said, In the midst of a national dilemma or a personal trial, Isaiah's cry to God's people still rings true. Behold your God. In scripture, God reveals himself as the gentle shepherd as well as a holy, transcendent, almighty king. He goes on to say, our creator God is greater than his creation, right? The source of true wisdom, he requires no counsel. Even the mightiest nations are under his sovereign control. And this is key. If you don't get anything, this is key. He goes on to say, when we immerse ourselves in scripture, we're invited to behold a God who is too great to fail us. Ladies, we must immerse ourselves in the scriptures. This is where you behold God, right here through the word of God as it defines him, as it explains him, as his love comes forth out of scripture. It leaps, like I said, leaps from the page into your heart. Have you ever been reading and that's happened? Where you know that the context might be Israel, or you know that the context you know, is talking about Judah, or, what, or Paul's talking, but when you're reading that scripture, it literally leaps into your heart, and you know that you know that God gave you that, right? This is where we behold our God. So, where do you find yourself tonight? Are you focused on a heartache that's breaking your heart? You might be heartbroken tonight. Are you focusing on a disappointment? It's so easy to do, right? We get disappointed. Sometimes we sit there and we think, this is not where I thought my life would be at this time, right? Sometimes we get to that point. Are you focused on the conflicts in your life? Are you focused on fixing your husband? You want to fix him. <laughs> Just got to fix that man. <laughs> Are you focused on that? Are you focused on your friends? Are you focused maybe on social media? And it's, I'm not putting social media down. 
in the right format. I'm not putting that down. But sometimes we get too focused in it, I think. Or are you too focused in the events of the day? Some people are so focused. Now, I love prophecy. Love it. Love, love, love. It's, it's what, three quarters of the Bible is prophecy, right? But are you too focused on it? Are you too focused on it? Where has your focus been? Well, ladies, we have been invited to behold, to fix our focus on, to gaze upon, to catch sight of, to notice, to pay attention to the God of all gods and the Savior of the world, Jesus. He's a God who is too great to fail us. Behold, the Sovereign Lord has come to save you and I from our sins. And this is the heart of Christmas. Behold, the Christ child who was born to die, to then raise again the third day, raise from the dead, so that we might live and have eternal life. You know, ladies who attended retreat heard this little story, but I just felt like the Lord wanted me to repeat this. Um, when I was young, I was in um, like a choral theater, you know, and uh, we did performing arts, and I was in an extravaganza, and I'm going to date myself, of this is the dawning of the age of Aquarius, the age, you know, of Aquarius, you know, we'd be up there, woo, you know, and, um, and we, you know, we're just we, every day after school, we'd have to go to theater. We'd have to practice, you know. And many times, our director would stop us in our tracks while we were, like, giving our best. Like, giving our best. Or at least thinking in practice that we were giving our best. And he would clap his hands. All eyes, center stage. All eyes. And he would just stand in the center stage and just clap his hands. All eyes center stage because he was trying to get our attention, and we would all stop where we were at, even in our in our positions, <laughs> and and we would turn and gaze at our director because he had something important to say to us, and he wanted to fix what we were doing wrong. And I feel like God is clapping His hands tonight, and He is saying He's calling you and I to stop to take notice. He's saying, all eyes center stage. All eyes on me. You see, ladies, all eyes on him because he's the fixer of all things in your life. What you got going, what you think may never be healed, God heals. God is great. God is good. And he wants to just have you focused on him, keeping your eyes fixed on him. Behold, come and see what God has done. It is a story of amazing love. Max Licato said this, He came not as a flash of light or as an unapproachable conqueror, but as one whose first cries were heard by a peasant girl and a sleepy carpenter. God tapped humanity on its collective shoulder and said, pardon me, an eternity interrupted time, divinity interrupted carnality, and heaven interrupted the earth in the form of a baby. And Christianity was born in one big heavenly interruption. Wow. And that's what Christmas is about. That's the heart of Christmas. Love incarnate, love divine, love lavished, love sacrificed, love unfailing, never ending, eternal and forever. And I want to close with this. As I reread the story of the birth of Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew and Luke, it hit me. What really hit me was all those that beheld him. Mary beheld him. Joseph beheld him. The angel of the Lord beheld him. The shepherds beheld him. The eastern star beheld him. 
it was like it just pointed down onto the Christ child for all to see where this beautiful savior of the world was born. The wise man men beheld him, the magi or magi. And my question to you is, won't you? Won't you? Will you behold him? Will you stop still, cease all else, all eyes center stage, give your full attention to our beautiful, amazing, unfailing God who loves you as if you were the only one to love. Behold him, love divine. Amen? Amen. Amen. Father God, as we look on this unfailing love and we see what you have done for us, it does take our breath away. Oh, that we would be women who will just stop all and begin to behold you in such a fresh new way that our love for you will grow deeper, our passion for your word and for you will develop in a deeper fashion that you would be glorified, Lord, as we walk in a world that has no definite answers. We have you the most definite answer in all of history and time. Oh, how we love you. How we praise you. May you bless the women here tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you.